Intermolecular forces. Today we talk about the interactions among molecules that ultimately help in maintaining the physical state of the substance. We're going to start by talking about molecular dipoles. And the idea starts with electronegativity. As you may recall from our discussion of electronegativity in terms of attracting electrons towards the atom, uh, the moment you combine two elements of different kinds together, one of them will have a greater tendency of attracting electrons towards it as a result of having a greater effective nuclear charge. And you may recall that we derive an equation for the bond dissociation enthalpy of the hetero, uh, heteroatomic diatomic molecule in comparison to the homonuclear diatomic molecules. And we, um, just by looking at the numbers, associated the discrepancy in the average value of the enthalpy energies of the homonuclear molecules compared to the heteronuclear molecule uh, due to an ionic contribution that takes place as a result of one of the atoms attracting electrons more efficiently towards itself than the other. The atom that does that ends up with a delta minus charge, and the atom that is less able to attract electrons to itself develops a delta plus sign. That's creating this ionic contribution, which ultimately we associated with the value of electronegativity. Specifically, we associated this dipole moment to the difference in electronegativity of the two elements. So ultimately, we ended up with the equation shown right here, which we used to um, determine the delta H formation of a salt. But the key idea right here is that electronegativity, even though we can tabulate some values and even approximate them with the allen rocco formulas, we can look at the electronegativity values and the trends in the periodic table to make some qualitative assessments as to what kind of interaction molecules are going to have with each other. All right, so we're going to use the electronegativity idea in essence to describe the forces that keep molecules attracted to each other. All right, so here we go. First things first, we have to define something known as the dipole moment. The dipole moment you could think of as an arrow in the direction of higher electronegativity. Specifically, this starts at the delta plus end of the bond and goes towards the delta minus end. Another way to express this is that the dipole moment is directed towards the more electronegative element. So looking at the first molecule right here, HF, between the two atoms, fluorine is more electronegative because it lies farther to the right on the periodic table. Oh, and by the way, when we look at molecules, we are going to have to be dealing with the Vesper structure when it comes down to the net dipoles because the specific shape of the molecule will affect and determine whether some of these dipoles cancel out or not, which itself will determine whether the interaction is weak or strong among molecules. So we'll do the same thing for carbon tetrachloride. We'll draw it in a tetrahedral arrangement. Ammonia will be drawn as a trigonal pyramidal arrangement. Now, as I was pointing out, fluorine is more electronegative than hydrogen. So you'll have electrons being attracted towards it. Oxygen is also more electronegative than hydrogen, so the delta minus will reside on oxygen. Nitrogen is more electronegative than hydrogen, so the delta minus will reside on nitrogen. But in carbon tetrachloride, chlorine is in fact the more electronegative element. And so you'll develop a big delta plus for the carbon in the middle, uh, and the chlorines will all develop a delta minus. All right, now for hydro, hydrogen fluoride, the dipole moment is actually rather simple. You go from hydrogen towards fluorine, and that's the end of the story because we have only a diatomic molecule. For water, however, we actually have dipoles coming from both OH bonds, and they both go in the direction of the oxygen. But because one of them is pointing up and to the right, and the other one is pointing up and to the left, 
the components of this vector uh, partly cancel out. The right component and the left component of the dipole moment vectors do cancel out, but they're both pointing up. And since you have two up components, they actually add up to give you collectively a net dipole pointing upwards from the middle of where the hydrogens are present towards the oxygen and beyond. Now, nitrogen in ammonia, it's a little bit um, it's similar, but a little bit more complex. You have dipole moments arising from every single NH bond, but now you have a molecule that is not on a plane, but rather in 3D. Some of the bonds, as you can see here, the ones depicted in bold are coming out of the paper, and the ones depicted with the dash bonds are bonds that are going inside the plane of the paper, or the plane of the board, or in this case, the plane of the screen. Uh, so if you look at it, um, mathematically though, there's a way to uh, determine what's happening with these particular elements. You, um, you can, uh, Look at it this way. All of the bonds are moving upwards, as you can see right here, and uh, that movement upwards um, is not only for, for all of them, but it is definitely uh, going to add up to a final value that points up. But the other components, some of them go in, some of them go out, some of them go right, and some of them go left. So the other components do cancel out, and the only thing remaining are the components pointing upwards. And so uh, a way to look at it is to look at the molecule from the top down. And if you do that, you get roughly the picture shown here, uh, which is no different than a circle uh, cut into three equal parts. And mathematically, this can actually be deconvoluted by using some trigonometry. Specifically, the angles here are roughly 120 degrees. So if you draw a um, perpendicular vector in respect to the vertical line right here, you'll have 30 degrees left over of angle uh, now forming this right triangle. And the X component, the one that goes left and right, can be depicted and determined by the cosine of 30 degrees, which is negative 0.87 as it points to the left or positive 0.87 as it points to the right. So those two components cancel out directly. Now, the other components, um, the ones that are pointing down, can be given by the sine of 30, which is negative one half in both instances. So, altogether, they add up to give you a negative one value, but you will notice that there is this bond that's going straight up. And that bond is not going over an angle, it's going just straight up. So, it counts as a whole number. So, you have a plus one and a negative one, which cancels out entirely. So, those two components totally cancel out. And you can see with trigonometry alone that, yes, it does work out that way rather nicely. So the only thing left standing is the uh, vectors pointing upwardly in the molecule towards the nitrogen. So this is a molecule that we would say has a dipole moment, much like water, much like HF. And we will call all these molecules polar because they have a net dipole persisting in the molecule. All right, now for carbon tetrachloride, the idea is similar to ammonia, but there is a little bit of complexity here. Uh, if you draw the vectors going towards the chlorines, um, you're going to basically have the same picture that you started with with the tetrahedral structure. And it may not be particularly obvious to you what's going to happen. So I'm going to try to show you really, you know, really briefly how this works out. You could think of each one of the bonds here. You could take two of the chlorines and think of them as being basically two vectors separated by an angle of 109.5 degrees, basically your typical tetrahedral vesper shape bond angle. And if you bisect that into two equal parts, well, then now you're left over with an angle of 54.8. All right, and now if we apply trigonometry to this problem, we can take the cosine of 54.8 and the sine of 54.8, and simply we just have to keep track of whether we're going to the left or to the right. Um, if we take the sine of this angle, we're going to be talking about the x component going to the left or the x component going to the right. So for the left triangle, we're going to the left, so we put a negative sign in front of the value of sine of 54.8. Uh, the cosine is just going up, so that's just positive. For the second triangle, uh, 
the sine component is going to the right, so it's positive, and the cosine is going up, that's also positive. So the sine components cancel out. The cosine components, however, add up to a value of 1.16. But you have a different triangle pointing in the opposite direction, so you could think of it this way. Top chlorine and chlorine down and to the right form one equilateral triangle, or actually isosceles triangle rather, and then the other two right here form a second isosceles triangle, which has the same parameters of sine and cosine. Uh, and so what happens is that the cosine components end up being negative, but of equal magnitude to the positive cosine components of the other bonds. So ultimately, everything cancels out. And you end up ultimately with no dipole. And this is an interesting molecule because the bonds themselves have a dipole moment. And we will actually refer to the bonds as being polar. but because the molecule is fully symmetrical in a tetrahedral arrangement, all of the dipoles cancel out. So the molecule as a whole is nonpolar, even though it has polar bonds. This can actually happen. All right, now in the next example, we're going to talk about um, whether molecules are regarded as being polar or nonpolar simply by looking at the symmetry of the molecule itself. Um, and uh, the idea right here is that you want to see where the dipoles are pointing. And typically speaking, unless you have the same atoms pointing in opposite directions, the chances are that they will not cancel out. Uh, case in point, look at your selenium tetrafluoride. Uh, that molecule will be polar because, yes, top and flooring, top flooring and bottom flooring will cancel out, but the left fluorines don't cancel out with anything on the right. There's no fluorines on the right. The second molecule has chlorine up, chlorine down, chlorine up and to the left, chlorine down and to the right. So that cancels out fully. That's nonpolar. The molecule right here is trigonal planar, but instead of having three chlorines, you have one atom that's not the same. So this will have some residual dipole moment, meaning that the molecule will be polar. And then this one, I'm you know kind of extending. Uh, what the definition is, because this is technically an ionic substance, but everything is in opposite corners. Bromine is uh, up and to the left, bromine is down and to the right. Down and to the left for chlorine, up and to the right for chlorine, top and bottom for waters, they all cancel out. Technically, this molecule will be regarded as nonpolar. The molecule over here, silicon with two bromines and two chlorines, on one phase you have two bromines, on the opposite phase you have two chlorines, so they don't exactly cancel out. So this molecule will be considered polar. Same thing for SO2. The two oxygens are pointing in the same direction. They're both pointing down. No oxygens pointing up. Nothing will cancel out. So we'll end up with a polar molecule. And right here for uh, a krypton with two chlorines and two fluorines, you have two chlorines on one side of the molecule, two fluorines on the opposite side. They won't fully cancel out. So you end up with a polar molecule. And lastly, the molecule right here has um, a trigonal planar shape in the middle where the double bond is located, but you have a CHF2 pointing up and to the left and another CHF2 pointing down and to the right. So technically, this will cancel out and be nonpolar. So simply by looking at the symmetry of the molecules, we can determine the polarity of the molecules themselves. Um, and uh, this will be the main premise of the rest of the lecture. So with that, let's stop the video right here and we'll continue on the next one.